Hello and welcome to this episode of Physical Attraction. This week we've got a guest on the show, Kit Yates, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of Mathematical Sciences and co-director of the Centre for Mathematical Biology at the University of Bath. And he's written an excellent book, The Maths of Life and Death, on the various applications of maths in biology and the world around us more generally, from epidemics to algorithms and exponential growth. He's been interviewed extensively in the media lately to discuss the COVID-19 pandemic. We talked about that and the rest of his work, as well as the book, in this interview. I hope you enjoy. Hi, Kit. Thanks very much for agreeing to come on the show. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's great to be here. Uh, predominantly, we're going to talk about the themes in your book, The Maths of Life and Death, which I recommend everyone to read. It's already informed some of the coronavirus coverage that we've done on this show in recent weeks. But let's start with a few questions so that the audience gets to know you a bit better. So you're a mathematical biologist currently at the University of Bath, and you started off with an undergraduate degree in pure mathematics from Oxford. So I kind of like to ask this question of everyone, even though not everyone has this sort of light bulb narrative moment when they suddenly decided what they wanted to do with their lives. But how did you decide from uh, being a mathematics undergrad that applying mathematics specifically to biological problems was what you wanted to do? Yeah, so certainly I didn't have a a light bulb moment. I I think even at school, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I really enjoyed biology and physics and chemistry and maths at school. And then when it came to uh, having to choose at A-level which ones I wanted to do, um, I I realised that biology was going to be difficult for me because I didn't really like cutting things up. And that seemed to be quite a big component, cutting up fish heads and eyeballs and stuff. I walked into a classroom at GCSE level once and nearly passed out because of the, of the fish head on the table. So I decided I should quit biology and focus on, on maths a bit. And then because I'd done maths and further maths at A-level, I decided that I would do that at university. But I was a bit sad to be leaving biology behind me. thought, you know, this is a subject which, which can unlock the secrets of, of life. And I was sad to have left that behind. But actually, when I got to university, I found out that maths is really useful for describing the whole of the world around us. So uh, engineering, engineers use maths to build bridges and uh, physicists use maths to understand quantum phenomena and general relativity. Uh, and actually, excitingly for me, I found out that mathematicians and biologists use mathematics to un- unpick the secrets of, of life. So I did a couple of really good courses with an amazing lecturer, a guy called Philip Maney, who's a fellow of the Royal Society now. Uh, and I decided that uh, I, I quite enjoyed this. But honestly, I never knew that I was going to do a master's degree until I started doing the master's degree, basically. I never knew I'd be good enough mm-hmm. to do it. I didn't know I was going to do a PhD until I got accepted to to do the PhD. I didn't know whether I'd be good enough I didn't know I was going to become a mathematical biologist until I arrived there. But certainly once I'd done these courses in mathematical biology, that seemed to be the only subject that I really wanted to do from then on. Okay, okay, that's interesting. And I think it's a really it's a really fascinating area because it's sort of in some ways it's introducing levels of mathematics to biology. I think physicists have this reputation for a bit of arrogance when it comes towards biological sciences, but there's so many of the intricate systems that kind of evolution has come up with naturally. Mm. They've got all these beautiful and complex mathematical properties that we can learn a lot from. Sure. And ultimately, you know, we are biological creatures in a biological world, yeah. as we're all kind of being reminded of quite forcefully at the moment. So yeah. any kind of greater understanding we can glean from applying mathematics to these systems is, is going to end up having benefits for us as well. So so if you'd like, could you tell us about some of the areas where uh, applying these mathematical tools to problems in biology or, or maybe even vice versa, have mm. revealed uh, interesting things that you know that, that wouldn't have come about from pure biology or pure mathematics, I suppose. Yeah, I think there's a couple of, of, of areas that I would touch on to try to answer that. Like mathematical biology is a relatively new field. We're, you know, we've been thinking about quantifying biology for a long time, but really we're probably only about 60, 70 years old in terms of our field. Um, there's been... A, during that time one of the big things that we've been working on is is modeling of the heart so trying to model individual cells of the heart but also model the whole organ so we've come a long way from the very early punch card models of electrophysiology of the heart back in the 1960s to describe how cells polarize and depolarize when they're contracting inside the heart and we've built those models put those cells together to a point now where we have Uh, incredibly detailed and complex models of the different aspects of the heart which is a really complex system it has electrophysiology it has musculature it has fluid dynamics in there understanding blood flow so we've built up this really complicated model and now we can start to use it we can use it for personalized medicine so we can take a scan of someone's body and build a replica model of their heart inside a computer and test what happens when we give that heart a certain drug and see how they'll be affected without actually having to endanger that person's life by trialing a drug on them or 
for example, drug companies are using this idea of what's called systems biology, whole systems biology, to to try to um, discover drugs and, and test early drug candidates. So you start off with hundreds of possible chemical candidates and you need to rule those out. Uh, and you can do a large proportion of that now in silico, in the computer, using these realistic models, rather than having to spend loads of money trialing each one of them, testing them on animals, which we don't want to do as much as possible. Uh, and so we can bring down the cost of drugs and hopefully that eventually gets passed on to the consumers. So that's just a sort of case study of where mathematical biology has been really useful, really important in the real world. And so the other, the other sort of idea that I want to touch on to explain uh, perhaps more theoretically how mathematical biology has, has been important and has changed things is uh, an idea which is called Turing patterning. So Alan Turing people will be familiar with as uh, would World War II code breaker, perhaps even as a pioneer or founding father of artificial intelligence. But in mathematical biology, we also claim Turing as one of our own as well. So um, he wrote a really important paper back in 1952, a couple of years before he killed himself, which is called On the Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis. And in this paper, it's one of the most important papers in our field. Um, he uh, writes about the potential for a simple mathematical model to explain how animal pigmentation patterns occur. And so he comes up with this crazy idea, which is called diffusion driven instability. So he takes a system which is stable, it's equilibrated, so everything's in equilibrium. And he, and he adds something like diffusion, which we think of as probably being smoothing as well. You can imagine dropping a, a blob of ink into water and watching it spread out and become evenly dispersed as it diffuses through the water. So this idea of diffusion being stabilizing perhaps. So he adds diffusion to this stable system. And what he finds that is under certain conditions, you can uh, get patterns from, you can destabilize this system. So it's called diffusion driven instability. And the patterns that you can see from these systems look remarkably like the sorts of patterns that you get on different animals. So you can get spots, you can get stripes, you can get labyrinthine maze-like patterns, um, and you can obviously false color them to make them look like animal coat patterns. Unfortunately, there isn't actually a huge deal of evidence to support Turing's theory being the mechanism that underlies animal coat patterns. But perhaps more importantly than, than actually the application in, in coat patterns is that this model, has, uh, because it's relatively simple, has, has introduced a sort of paradigm shift in our field. It's got biologists to think about problems in a mathematical way, and it's got mathematicians to get seriously interested in the biology enough to understand its mechanisms. And actually, there have been several examples of where Turing pattern or Turing systems, Turing instabilities have been found in real biological systems, but just not in the coat patternings for which they were originally planned, unfortunately. But it's a really crazy mechanism, a really crazy idea, and it really changed our field and it's changed the way that mathemat mathematicians and biologists interact with each other. It's, it's a really interesting example because, I mean, as, as you say, it's... <laughs> It's an area where you wouldn't necessarily think about this being something that happens on the on the macro level, on the sort of mm. level of a creature. You can imagine physical processes like diffusion being important for, for example, setting the length scale of a cell yeah. uh, in terms of how easy it is for, uh, I don't know, whether it's molecules that are related to energy or respiration sure. to diffuse across or water to diffuse across. Yeah. But actually seeing mathematical patterns that manifest themselves on the large scale when creatures interact is something that I think is, uh, I mean, in some ways it's not really that counterintuitive because the, 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 you like a pattern like diffusion is going to come from uh, the way that lots of different elements interact with yeah, each other. Absolutely. And those elements could just as easily be uh, large scale animals yes. behaving according to some sort of like avoidance principle or colliding with each other and then moving apart and that sort of thing. Exactly. Um, yeah. But it, it, it's still interesting to see these patterns manifest themselves on, on a macro scale as well as a micro scale. I guess. Yeah, they, they can manifest at even larger scales. People use them for modeling vegetation in, in the deserts. You often see striped pattern in vegetation. Uh, and people use these components of water and gravity and, and vegetation growth interacting with each other to build these reaction diffusion models. So on far larger scales, even than individual animals, organisms interacting with each other, you get these ecological scale patterns. So, yeah, it's really sort of interesting to see these at work on, on multiple different scales. Nowadays, your main research focuses on where stochasticity, or I suppose what we'd like naively call randomness, plays a role in biological systems, and particularly where it differs from a deterministic model of the system. And so, you know, in, in terms of physics, I guess we would say you have uh, Newtonian physics, which is quite deterministic, and uh, mm. you can add in uh, lots of extra mathematical tools um for example uh, 
the difference between solving an ordinary differential equation and a stochastic differential equation. And these things have been developed over the years, uh, which are used in, in areas of physics and mathematics mm. and other, other sorts of modeling. Um, and of course, they can also play a role in these biological systems. So um, could you give us a, so, some sort of examples of how this is uh, feeding into your research at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, I I guess the research that I do could sometimes be classed as statistical physics. It's not too far away. We use a lot of the same tools, uh, but the difference is that we try to apply these to, to biological systems rather than physical systems. So uh, one nice example that I've worked on for a number of years is the modelling of locusts and how locusts interact with each other and how they how they swarm and how they stay stable in their swarm. So uh, a few years ago, we did an experiment where we put locusts into a ring shaped arena. It was about a metre across and there was a sort of 20 centimetre area in the middle, where, which was blocked off. So there was this this ring shaped arena on the floor and we put locusts into it and uh, we watched to see what happened. And when you put four or five locusts in, nothing much interesting happens. They don't sort of do anything exciting. But when you put 20 locusts in the arena together, they start to march together in the same direction around the arena for a long period of time. And then interesting. Interestingly, spontaneously, within a short period of time, they will actually switch direction and start moving in the opposite direction around this ring-shaped arena, and they'll continue to switch for the whole duration of the experiment, which lasts for about eight hours usually. Um, mm-hmm. The interesting thing about that is that when you put more locusts in, it takes them longer to switch. So somehow the number of locusts is a, is a proxy for the stability of the swarm. So we were interested in trying to model this experiment to say, can we get a mathematical model which describes this and what, what can we learn from this? So we used what's called a, um, an individual based model. Each of these locusts is modeled as an individual. It's often called a self-propelled particle model in this case because they these particles propel themselves they move along under their own uh, um, speed if you like but they also take account of the locusts in their local neighborhood so if they get too close to other locusts they get repelled from them if they're too far away they get attracted and they try to align with their neighbors to make sure they're in roughly the same orientation but the the key thing about this is that there's noise in this system it's really noisy if you just had a purely deterministic system you wouldn't see these switches of direction in the locusts so interestingly we built this model and then we tried to make sure it matched the data and what we found was that what we had to do is have the locusts increase the randomness in their movement when they were out of line with each other. So when they found themselves uh, in a low alignment state compared to their neighbours, what they would do is increase the randomness of their motion. They would, to some degree, they would panic. And actually that would help them find their way back into this ordered state more more quickly. Huh. So they were using noise constructively to keep their swarm together for longer. And we have some sort of fairly uh, gruesome explanations for why this might be the case. Largely, we think it's driven potentially by cannibalism. So the best way for locusts to get salt and protein into their diet is actually to eat each other. And there's a there's a lot of literature which suggests that these locusts, the main driving force driving them forward is not the, necessarily the search for food, but it's actually being nibbled from behind by their neighbours. And if you anaesthetise the back part of a locust, what you find is that um, other locusts will come along and nibble it and actually eat its back legs without it even wow. realizing it. So, uh, so, so these, this, this uh, being eaten by neighbors is a driving force. And there's a really another really interesting experiment done in the in the desert in Utah where locusts were placed in four different orientations um, in respect to an oncoming swarm. So one facing onto the swarm, one facing with its back to the swarm, and two with their sides either side facing to the swarm. And they watched to see which of these four poor locusts got eaten the most. And it turns out it's the ones with their sides facing the oncoming swarm. So the guys with their legs facing backwards can kick out and protect themselves. The guys who are face onto the swarm, generally the other locusts ignore them because they know that they can see them. But the guys who have their sides facing on got eaten the most. So the idea was that when locusts find themselves in a disordered state, they are likely to be facing other locusts with their side. So they panic, they increase the randomness of their motion and that helps them to get back in line and it helps the swarms to stay aligned for longer. So that was a really important example where noise played a really important role and you just wouldn't have found these results without the noise in the model. So it's a bit like a sort of self-correcting system in the sense that when some external thing causes the locust to panic and when it might most need to go back into its formation, the noise is kind of helping it correct the errors that are creeping into the into the formation that's been built so far? Yeah, to some degree, exactly. Yeah, the, the, the locusts are really constructively using this noise to help them stay aligned. And yeah, if you like, it's a bit like an error correcting system, yeah. 
It's it's interesting because we were just doing, I just uh, recorded an episode that we'd written ages ago about statistical mechanics and this idea of having, you know, you have macro states of a system where you'll have some temperature and some volume mm. and so on. And then also you have micro states which correspond to, you know, the individual positions and velocities of every particle in the mm. system. And you wouldn't necessarily think about a group of locusts as being able to manifest itself in this kind of sure. way that might be amenable to statistical mechanics. But, you know, I guess I guess what you're pointing out is that if you, if you look at these things, there's actually quite a lot of underlying order and structure that you might not initially think that that sort of shares analogies with bits of mathematics that have been uh, developed in in other contexts yeah exactly the the individuals to you know the individual the micro to macro properties um, are really very similar to the Ising model which is a classic model in statistical physics about magnetic um, poles and and how magnets um, uh, change over time uh, and how noise can impact that uh, yeah, so the, the locusts, uh, although, you know, we know it's only a toy model, it's not exactly what the locusts are, are really doing in reality. It's much more complicated, but it can, these, these sort of toy statistical physics models can capture a lot of the important behavior and answer some of the important questions we're trying to ask. Yeah, it's a bit like some of these uh, nearest neighbor interactors, I guess. Absolutely. And in, in the case of the magnetic uh, uh particles we're talking about i guess magnetic forces between them here we're talking about locusts biting each other on the arse and that's <laughs> right, the exactly. nearest neighbor interactions yeah. okay before before we get onto the topic of uh, the mass and life and death your book more generally i think it's worth pointing out that a really obvious area uh, where mathematics and biology intersect is this mathematical field of epidemiology and you had a whole chapter on this susceptible infective or infectious and removed mm. and uh, i was reading that chapter i've been listening to uh, adam kuchowski's book on the same thing mm. and it strikes me that people in this field must find it so bizarre that things that were their sort of bread and butter things like the r number mm. sir models and so mm. on are suddenly being discussed on the news relentlessly yeah and um, even as a physicist suddenly seeing everyone talk about exponential growth which you know as a physicist is the solution to the one differential equation you like to solve <laughs> as an undergraduate um was was pretty surreal so uh, could you tell us a little bit about you know what you've learned in the course of researching for the book about the history of mathematical epidemiology where it comes from um and what what are the sort of principles of it and then and then we'll talk a little bit later on about things more directly related to the pandemic that we're all unfortunately going through at the moment. Yeah, it's uh, it's really bizarre, as you say, to see these mathematical concepts being talked about in the news by politicians. I, I found it fascinating. And, and yeah, now is a time when as mathematicians, we should really capitalise this, capitalise on this situation and really um, I mean, not to be uh, too um, uh, opportunistic, but we should uh, try to make sure that people really do appreciate the, the importance that maths uh, complain in our society um yeah in terms of what i learned about mathematical epidemiology um it's uh it's got a long history actually so um edward jenner developed the first vaccine back in 1796 for smallpox but actually uh even before jenner had developed his vaccine there was an idea going around called variolation which involved exposing yourself to a small amount of material associated with smallpox so maybe scabs that had been ground up you might snort them up your nose uh, or you might blow pus from someone else's scabs uh, you might put pus from someone else's scabs into your uh, an open wound it doesn't sound very nice but uh, this was this idea was that you would try to uh, introduce a, a small and milder version of the disease by variolating yourself against the disease so it's sort of an analogous principle to vaccination but not so not so well formalized uh, and this spread through through the middle east and came into europe in the early 1700s where smallpox was absolutely rife um, and uh, the problems with variolation were that although in, in some cases it did protect people um, sometimes the practice didn't protect a patient from a second more serious attack of smallpox because their immunity had waned or they didn't get immunity from doing it and actually two uh, percent of people who were variolated died because of the variolation um, rather than getting smallpox. So although that was small compared to the proportion of people getting smallpox, not everyone would actually uh, get smallpox in the, in the first place. So the question at the time was, should we be variolating everyone with this 2% risk of people being variolated who will die? Or should we just let people, let smallpox move around unchecked and hope that we don't get it, even though smallpox has a higher infection uh, fatality rate so um, no one really knew what the answer to this was and then in steps Daniel Benui who in my opinion is one of the most underrated mathematicians uh, of the last few hundred years he is a, he was a fluid dynamicist so he proposed equations which um, explained how wings create lift which allow planes to fly um, he also was uh, was a doctor so he he played around with with medicine he created a way of measuring blood pressure which although 
uh, it worked. It was a bit brutal. You had to insert a glass tube directly into your artery to figure it figure out what your blood pressure was but it worked and people didn't die from it so it, it seemed to be the method that prevailed for <laughs> a few hundred classic, classic right <laughs> exactly uh so it seemed to be the method that prevailed for for a hundred or so more years uh, but actually then Bernoulli got interested in this question of, of variolation and he used simple mathematical ideas combined with um tables of mortality to to understand whether variolation was effective or not um, and he suggested, his model suggested that nearly 50% of infants born would survive to the age of 25 if they were variolated. Now, that doesn't sound very good by today's standard, but it was a significant improvement on the 43% that would have survived to that age without variolation if smallpox were allowed to rage freely in the population. And he even showed that um, overall this, this medical intervention could raise life expectancy by over three years. So it's the first real example of, of really good quantitative modelling showing uh, whether an intervention can can work or not. So it's the first steps in mathematical epidemiology. The, the really big um, mathematical models that we, we're sort of talking about today still that came about uh, from the 1920s, the classic one is by two scientists called Kermack and McKendrick, uh, and they came up with this SIR model, uh, which is um, we break the population down into three different what we call compartments, S for susceptible, I for infective, and R for recovered or removed, which is a sort of euphemism for people who've recovered or people who've died, unfortunately. Uh, and their model was able to say things like, what would be the final size of the epidemic? How many people would get infected if we didn't do anything to stop the disease passing around? How many people would die? Uh, how many people would survive? Uh, and they also were able to calculate the herd immunity threshold. So how many people do you need to have infected before the disease is denied these susceptible infected contacts it needs to pass on through the population so theirs was a really towering contribution and ever since then we've been building and adapting that most basic of um, mathematical models to try to understand diseases with different sorts of transmission patterns mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i think it's quite interesting to to reflect on this as well because the the sir model as you say is fairly it's mathematically quite simple mm. um but i think one of the things that i've found uh, important to try and explain to people uh in, in, when it comes to mathematical modeling, because there's been so much discussion about modeling, you know, there's uh, mm. Professor Neil Ferguson's model, which mm. partially motivated the lockdown in the West. And yeah. there's, you know, SIR models, which now everyone with a computer seems to be running and submitting papers sure. to the point that there's about 23,000 preprints since January that have come up, many of which probably are from people contributing to epidemiology for the first time. Yeah. Um, and th 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 I suppose the point to make is that when you're looking at models, you have models at different ranges of complexity and different ranges of abstraction. And actually, sometimes adding in more features to a model can almost give you false confidence in mm. what the model is producing. And the simplest models still have properties that um, that turn out to ultimately resemble what actually happens. Because if you think about an SIR model, I guess there's some assumptions there, like, for example, that everyone is uh, mingling equally, mm. equally with each other. Mm. Um that you can that you can question, yeah. and there are there are ways that you can try and refine it and make it more complex to uh, take into account some of the things that uh, aren't included yeah. in the most basic model. Yeah. Yet, yet also, it, it's interesting that these simple models can quite often give you you know an order of magnitude correct answer, which yeah. in some cases is all you need if if the difference is uh, you know between. Uh, so, you know, horrible as it is to say, if the difference is between 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 4 people mm. dying in an, in an outbreak, um, you don't need to be more precise than an order of magnitude to know what you have to do. If no, that makes sense. that's absolutely right. Um, yeah, I think we, we usually go in the in mathematical modelling field by Occam's razor, which said, says the model should be as simple as possible to answer the question you're trying to ask, but, but no simpler than that. And so there's definitely an argument for having simple models like the, the basic SIR model. Uh, Neil Ferguson's model is an incredibly complicated agent-based model which effectively models every individual in the United Kingdom as as an individual. They go to work, they come back from work, they go to school, they come back, they mingle in the community. Uh, there's lots of parameters in the model. It's incredibly complicated and it's, it was largely originally parameterized and built for, for flu modeling. Um, and it gives it gives these, these estimates of, of hundreds of thousands of people unfortunately dying if we don't do anything about the disease. But the, the interesting thing to, to say about that is a simple SIR model with the same value of, of the basic reproduction number, which is one of the key models of uh, key numbers in these models, actually gives a very similar prediction of how many people get infected and how many people will die if you don't do anything about this about this pandemic. So it's not to say that these 
um, more complex models are not useful because actually you can really play with them, get deep down into them and see what happens when you make certain interventions on the way that people actually move around because you have that in the model. But certainly if you just want a headline prediction of how many people are going to die at the end of this epidemic, if we don't do anything about it, then actually an SIR model or a slightly more complicated SEIR model where we have an extra class uh, for uh, exposed individuals. So those are people who have the disease but can't yet pass it on one of those models can actually give you a rough estimate of, of how many people at least tell you um, that actually if you don't do anything, it's going to be a massive catastrophe. So you don't always need the, the super complicated model to tell you some of the basic things that depend on the question you're trying to answer. Mm -hmm. I think that's impo an important point to make because, as you say, the more complex the model, the more questions you can ask of it. But also, you know, it's not necessarily going to give you a better headline figure than on the uh, on, a, on an uncontrolled epidemic scenario than a, than a less complicated one. One of the things, so you've done courses for uh, the University of Bath, I think, recently that are explaining how SIR models work. Mm. And one of the things that I was interested in is some of the variants of these models that have mm. started to show up a bit, um, particularly the ones that are trying to take into account this uh, phenomenon of heterogeneity, mm. uh, which is to say some people have more interactions than others. And does this mean that um, there are certain people whose immunity, I guess, is is more of a contributor to reducing R uh, mm. than than others. And it strikes me, you know, just from the outside, not having even thought about this question until this pandemic, that sure. this is probably an area of quite uh, active debate in the epidemiological community at the moment. And there's some people saying it's quite important and others are saying, well, maybe it's more important for STDs or something where mm. the contacts that you have are quite, uh, they would they resemble a network a lot more as opposed to a respiratory illness where, you know, someone can go on the tube and cough and suddenly they've technically had contact with everyone on the tube, you know, even though. Yeah. Uh, so I guess because there's more contacts and more links in the network, it behaves less like a network and more like a, mm. a, a, uh, an mm -hmm. idealized mm. SIR case where everyone is, is in contact with each other in a continuum. So I, I wondered if, you know, part, part of the question I'm asking is, whether you've uh, looked into or seen some variants of these that are trying to take into account of these effects. And the other thing is also, do you think there were some measurements that we could have taken in advance that would have resolved these questions? Because it would seem to me like this is the kind of thing that, you know, if you had some really good data to, to really work out how, mm. pe how people actually behave. I know that Professor Ferguson's model is, uh, you know, making assumptions based on statistics of transport and so on, mm. how often people use public transport, how much time they spend at home in the workplace, the average size of the office and so mm. on. But if you had actual uh, quantitative data following people around and tracking them, uh, do you think we'd be able to improve our models or do you think there'd still be a lot of uncertainty in, uh, in how people interact with each other? Yeah, so I think it goes back to this idea of whether models should, how complicated your models are and whether it's necessary to, to make them more complicated. And I think probably the answer is that you should only really make the model more complicated if you have the data to parameterize your model to, to actually back it up. In terms of mm -hmm. uh, understanding the network behavior of models, this is not my area of expertise. Uh, as you say, we have put some lectures uh, on, the, on the University of Bath website about some basic models and some extensions. And one of those is about network properties. Certainly it can be important especially in uh, sexually transmitted diseases where you really are thinking about contact networks. It's not unimportant in these diseases because people do tend to spend a lot of the time in, uh, in a household or at a particular workplace. Uh, although, as you say, there, there can be sort of well-mixed transmission uh, as well. So, so both aspects are important. Um, again, if you try to put in network structure into your model, you have to have a, a good understanding of what that network structure looks like. One thing that's really important, I think, in, in this, this particular pandemic is age structure. So understanding how people of different ages interact with each other. And the reason that's so important is because the disease affects people at different ages very differently. It's far more severe for older people than it is for younger people. So trying to understand um, how different age people interact with each other, potentially to help us shield older people, uh, to cut off particular um, uh, connections between different groups of people uh, is really important. We have these, these age structured trans transmission matrices where you see um, very high uh, levels of, of 
of interaction along the diagonal. So people of the same age tend to inter interact with each other. And there's also some off diagonal highlights as well, where you have parents interacting with children and to a lesser extent, grandparents interacting with grandchildren. Um, so, so you do see these, uh, th this behavior and it is important sometimes to put this into the model in particular, when we know that um, age can make a real difference to uh, how you're affected by this disease. And if we're planning a strategy where we're going to shield the most vulnerable people, then understanding the network work structure is, is going to be a really important part of, of modeling the disease. Yeah, exactly. It's interesting because there's been, you know, a lot of people talking about this idealized notion that we can let the disease pass through all of the younger people and, you know, our immune systems will do the job of fighting it off mm -hmm. and we'll shield all of the old people away from everyone else. So in effect, they want to live in a society with a really diagonal matrix um, and no off diagonal elements. Exactly. Um, and it's, and, and, and I mean, one has to be skeptical about how well this would work given the you know the, the what we've observed in countries so far in terms of unfortunately you know how this disease is getting into care homes and getting into places where you have a lot of uh, of elderly and vulnerable people that this would be a successful strategy but i suppose it's it just illustrates how important it is that we actually have that that data and that understanding of where these off diagonal elements are coming from and yeah you I'm... know the, because those would be the key people sorry to sort of inoculate and or test Yes. Um, to try and prevent this transmission from taking place if you were going to go through that strategy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a really short thing to say is that you know, people are sort of viewing care homes as if they are uh, an isolated island uh, away from everyone. But of course, people work in care homes. People come in from yeah. outside the community to deliver food to care homes. So that it's not as simple as just saying, let's let everyone out and then uh, we'll effectively shield everyone. It's not practically possible necessarily to effectively shield everyone, even with the best of intentions. So um, we do have to be really careful about how we how we uh, go forward in releasing lockdown in terms of um, if we are going to try to go for that strategy where we let all the young people get the disease can we try to make sure that we cut off those off diagonal elements as you suggest to to stop or to really protective effectively protect um, the older and more vulnerable people in society so, so so this is a question then i mean so there are a lot of historical disease outbreaks that we're learning from spanish flu ebola zika mm. sars and mers all of these different examples that have come up recently and i think the discussion in your book specifically uh, this book came out two or three years ago i think now of hpv vaccination um was fascinating and it's interesting to see how some of these same issues uh, dealing with asymptomatic carriers are kind of becoming important again today um, what do you think we can learn from historical outbreaks in, in dealing with this one? And what might we learn from the next outbreak uh, from this one? Yeah, so lots of, lots of things packed in there. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah they, um, in terms of uh, asymptomatic carriers, I think yeah, you can adapt these uh, SIR models to, adapt, to, to account for those. You have usually introduce a, what's called a carrier class, so people who have the disease, but you can't really tell that they have the disease and they can spread the disease. So classic examples include people like Typhoid Mary, who had was an asymptomatic carrier of typhoid. She was a cook, so she worked in, in people's houses and she made food for them, which they then ate, and then they then got typhoid. Uh, and eventually she had to be completely isolated. But it was really difficult because she didn't have any any symptoms. And we're seeing that to some extent in, in COVID-19. There, there is a period, um, well, there are certainly some asymptomatic carriers, but even for normal people who, who get the disease, there's usually an asymptomatic period before they show signs of uh, of the infection when they can pass the disease on and that makes it incredibly difficult to control so um, learning strategies for how to to un under, undertake and, and to look after these asymptomatic people how to deal with these asymptomatic people is, is a really important thing that we have to to try to figure out I think what what I'm taking from from this epidemic is that real-time epidemic modeling is really really hard um i think mm -hmm. each time we tackle infectious disease we probably learn something new but there are also going to be things that we get wrong we've learned things from past flu ep epidemics like washing hands is incredibly important it can reduce the reproduction number of a disease how many people each infected person passes it on to it can reduce that by a factor of three quarters if it's done effectively by everyone eight times a day for 20 seconds a day We've also learned that social distancing for airborne diseases can make a really big difference in terms of the transmissibility of the disease. But we have to be careful about how much we infer from one disease to another. So, for example, with flu, it's often thought that school kids are actually the main transmission, the main reservoir of flu, even though they're not particularly badly affected by it. But actually for COVID-19, that doesn't seem to be the case at the moment. It's also important that we're aware that we 
can't infer things from one country to another. So um, R, for example, this reproduction number that is often talked about in the news, the number of new infected cases from a single infected individual during their infectious period, we need to understand that that's actually not a fixed quantity. It depends on the country uh, and, the, and the place that the disease is passing through. So it's made up of three components, the transmissibility of the disease, how easy is it is to pass between people, um, the infectious periods, the longer you're infectious for, the more chances you have of passing the disease on, but also some uh, sort of less tangible quantity, which is to do with the number of susceptible individuals in the population, but also it takes into account the population structure. So the denser the population, the more contacts there are likely to be between people, as you mentioned on, on the tube, people coughing on each other and so on. Um, whereas in, in more rural areas, you're likely to have less contact. So that's going to decrease the, the reproduction number. So you can't necessarily infer parameters from one country to another, which is something that was done at the start of this epidemic. When you don't have enough data, you have to use data from somewhere else. So in Neil Ferguson's model, they use a value of the reproduction number, which is 2.4, from which was calculated early on from Wuhan. But actually, that value wasn't really appropriate for, for the United Kingdom. Uh, so if there are some things that I think we should take away from our response in the UK, they should probably be that we need to really carefully calibrate our models against the available data, even at a really early stage of the epidemic, because that is going to provide us with more accurate forecasts. And if we're going to base policy on mathematical models, it's important that those models are as transparent and easy to, for people to scrutinise as possible. Again, I don't want to be too critical of the, of the Ferguson group, but their code is thousands, tens of thousands of lines uh, long, and it's not particularly well documented, which doesn't make it easy for other people to see what's going on. Even if the science is correct, we would like to be able to replicate and reproduce that science. That's an important part of science. So having um, code that's well documented is, is a really important part of doing that. So those are the things I think we can learn directly from the pandemic so far, but I'm sure there'll be more things we can learn as we progress through it. Mm -hmm. And I think it really is just a vicious problem. I mean, I was sort of trying to get this across in an earlier episode to explain why it's so difficult is when you look at the things that we can observe and the things that we're trying to infer from them. So we're trying to infer from observations of cases, which we know we're not testing everyone and deaths, mm -hmm. which we also know we're not testing everyone. Mm -hmm. And we're also not always completely sure what's caused what death at what time. Yeah. Um, and there's delays in reporting those as well, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and from, from those imperfectly measured things of cases and deaths we're trying to infer factors that all depend on each other so the r which as you say is not some monolith but also depends on time and depends sure. on the location and the intervention and the people yeah. that's going on and then also the fatality rate which is not necessarily known in advance mm -hmm. and can vary between different groups and based on different comorbidities and so on yeah. so it's really really it's a very tricky challenge to try and it's almost like an underconstrained problem really to yeah. try and work out from imperfect measurements of what you've got going on um these these very crucial parameters for the disease and it means that for quite a long time you can actually plausibly have uh, a, a disease that for example spreads very quickly but is less deadly versus a disease that is more deadly but spreads more slowly and both of those situations will give you the same observations at the end of it yeah. and this has sort of I think contributed a lot to uncertainties in how to uh, deal with this disease and, and the range of estimates for things like uh, what percentage of people have the disease so far in that you've seen in in the literature all of which are you know broadly defensible if not necessarily prudent to assume that they're correct yeah that's absolutely right i think one of the earlier papers that came out was this this so-called oxford study by sinetra gupta's group in oxford and they were making exactly that point uh, that you yeah. can get the same number of deaths and track the curve quite nicely with using a model which in which the disease spreads very quickly but you and lots of people get infected but it has a low infection fatality rate so fewer people die or you can have a disease which is spreading more slowly which seems to be the case now that we're, we're a bit more sure about this and and a and a higher proportion of people are dying but really early on in the epidemic it's so hard to make those calls so i don't want to be too hard on the on the modelers who are who are working at the front line because real-time modeling of an epidemic is really really difficult mm -hmm. another area that, that has been discussed in association with this and that i learned a lot about from your book is the importance of sensitivity and specificity in testing and Bayes' theorem mm. um, and there's debate around this now because of these antibody tests that are coming out there's one from roche that's just been approved for the uk and this idea of immunity passports that might allow them to return to society uh, in the knowledge of being immune um, i mean aside from the fact that we don't really know too much about the biological mm. properties of immunity to this illness and how long lasting it might be there's also a very specific uh, what you call, I guess, a Bayesian concern with working out immunity from these tests. And there's a whole chapter of your book on this subject, which uses the examples of mammograms and things like that to, yeah. to point out this important um, uh, 
and I suppose counterintuitive uh, the importance of uh, how sensitive tests are. So would you like to talk about that for a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as you mentioned with, with, with mammograms and with screening more generally, you're screening a large proportion of people in the population who don't have uh, a dis- have the disease. So largely the, the proportion of, of, of breast cancer or prostate cancer in, in the population is, is low. And if you have a test which lacks even a little bit of what's called specificity, so it gives you some non-trivial rate of false positives, then you can end up, because you're testing such a large proportion of people that don't have the disease, you can end up that the vast majority of people who are given a positive result actually don't have the disease. The the false positives can massively outweigh the true positives. And that's really important when it comes to these antibody tests, because at the moment we suspect a, a relatively small proportion of people have actually had the disease. So almost certainly less than 10% across the whole of the United Kingdom. And if you have a, a test which you're you're purporting to give to people to say, you've had the disease, you've got a positive result, so you can go back to work, this, this idea of this immunity passport, or you can, you can start traveling, you can do what you like, um, then we need to be sure that we're, we're not releasing people who haven't had the disease back into the community. Because if we do, then potentially they can go and pick up the disease unknowingly and spread it around and we can kick off a second wave of the infection. So uh, the tests that have been, have been the antibody tests that have been brought out so far, one of them has been approved by the FDA. It's, it's by a company called Celex. And they say that if, if you have antibodies against COVID-19, then their test will tell you this correctly 93.8 percent of the time that that's the sensitivity so that's that sounds pretty good and if you don't then it will get it correct 95.6 of the time that's the specificity so that's that also sounds really good so both of both of these are above 90 90 percent so that sounds pretty encouraging but if you think about a hypothetical 10,000 people that you give this test to If as few as 3% of the global population have had COVID-19, which is what the WHO has recently been suggesting, the World Health Organization is suggesting it's as few as 3% and and people who've had the disease and recovered, then that means that the vast majority of those 10,000 people, so 9,700 of them, will not have had the disease and only 300 will have. And of the 300 recovered patients, we know that 93.8% of them or around 280 of them will be correctly told they have antibodies. That's That was the, the um, sensitivity of the test. That sounds pretty good. So most of them will be correctly identified. But because there's so many people who haven't had the disease, when we test them, even if 4.4% of them, which is the number of false positives we, we, we will get, are given a false positive, then that works out to be 427 people of those 9,700 who didn't have the disease. So that means that actually the, the number of false positives is is way more than the number of true positives. And actually, as the proportion of people who have had the disease gets lower, so if it were actually only 1% instead of 3%, then this figure gets worse and worse. It could be up to 80% of the people who are given a positive test actually uh, end up not having had the disease. So we need to be super careful that the tests are really, really specific, uh, meaning that they give a low rate of false positives if we're going to to roll these out to the community and test everyone and then take some action based on that of allowing people back into the community. It's really, really important to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And uh, I think th- th- this does feed into more on the maths of, of life and death, which I'd like to talk about a little more if we have time, mm. um, which is something that I think comes across very strongly from the book is how mathematics can be misused and misunderstood. And it comes back to this idea of the importance of a strong mathematical education and educating people about these fallacies. And it's like you say with these tests, you say, oh, it's got a 97% accuracy rate or whatever. And to the naive person who's not thought about this, sure. which you know includes most of us before yeah, yeah. we on into the details of it um you think great if that says i'm sick i've had the disease that's a 97 percent chance that it's right so that's almost certain therefore i've had it and you wouldn't take into account this bayesian uh, point and i think people can be kind of uh deluded a little bit by statistics that are misleading or quoted out of context and i think one classic example of this which you cover in your book is the the case of sally clark mm. um which is and and chapter four of the book is in fact all about kind of the ways to use statistics to uh, mislead people and yeah. dodgy uses of them so would you like to talk about some of these examples and the kind of logical fallacies that people need to inoculate themselves against when they see statistics particularly you know at the moment being reported in the media yeah absolutely so um the Sally Clark case is a really interesting one that she was a, a mother of, of two children who both died in in early infancy within the first few weeks of, of birth 
Um, and uh, because both of her children died, she was arrested and put on trial for the murder of her two children. And when it came to the trial, there was an expert witness, a guy called Professor Saroy Madhu, who was a paediatrician, not a statistician, we should note. Uh, and he came up with a figure which really convinced the jury of her guilt. So um, he was suggesting that there were there were no clear findings on the autopsies of her children, which explained how they had died and so he was suggesting well what happens when you don't have a diagnosis is you usually put that child's death down to sudden infant death syndrome which is the conclusion you reach when there's there's no other um conclusion to be found about how they had died and so he said well the the probability of of one sudden infant death in a family of the of the type of the clark so middle class wealthy family is one in eight thousand so pretty unlikely and then he said well the probability of two sudden infant deaths in such a family must be one in eight thousand multiplied by itself Uh, and he came up with this figure of one in 73 million of the probability uh, of having these two sudden infant deaths occur in the family if Sally Clark was was innocent of murdering her children. So it made it sound incredibly unlikely. In fact, he, he compared this one in 73 million figure to the probability of winning the Grand National, uh, which is you know one of the UK's biggest horse races. It has 40 horses in, e- in e- each running of the race. Winning the Grand National four times in a row, backing the least likely horse to win, the outsider, each time, which seems pretty unlikely Uh, to the general public but actually what he had done is to make a really simple mistake assuming that these two deaths were independent of each other so you could just simply multiply the probabilities of death by itself to find out the probability of these two deaths occurring and of course we know actually that sudden infant death syndrome there are multiple risk factors associated with it so sleeping in the bed with your child smoking uh, and of course genetic factors which of course these two kids would have shared because they had the same mum and dad and genetic factors dramatically increase the risk so once you know that you've had one child who's died of sudden infant death syndrome the probability of a second child dying of sudden infant death syndrome is is dramatically more likely so you can't just multiply these two things together it's a really simple mistake that people often make assuming that two events are independent uh, but actually it doesn't really always work like that so you have to be really careful um, but there are other other mistakes that I try to cover in the book, things like mismatched framing, where drug companies like to present the benefits of their drug using what's called a relative risk, usually as a big percentage figure to make it look good. But they present the side effects using the absolute risk. So uh, usually small figures, usually represented as decimals to make uh, to make the, the side effects seem trivial in comparison to the benefits. So. All of these, all of these sorts of tricks can be used. I try to detail a few of them uh, in in that chapter of the book. It's called uh, "Don't Believe the Truth." That chapter, because uh, it's not that people are necessarily lying, uh, and I don't think newspapers often lie in their in their headlines. But actually, they shine a different light on a particular aspect of the truth, and they try to paint a different picture by using um, different different sort of statistics and and trying to uh, manipulate you with with the numbers to make you believe that the numbers are an inherently true picture of what's happening so we need to be really careful especially in the media when we're listening to politicians that we don't just take everything at face value Mm -hmm. and you can see how this could be done in really naive ways as well like for example if someone said i've developed a drug that if taken by patients with covid19 98 percent of them get better and you might think oh that's great And then you realise that actually 98% of patients with COVID-19 get better with standard of care anyway. It's just a very small percentage of people who, you know, go on to have really, really bad problems. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, for example, controlling clinical trials is incredibly important. Again, I touch on that a little bit in the book. But, yeah, making sure that you know how many people will recover without taking this drug as well is really important. Uh, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the other areas that I wanted to talk about that's covered in the book is, I guess, the the power of mathematical algorithms. Mm. Um, so, you know, I, I went to a machine learning conference last year, and the thing that really shouldn't have surprised me, but sort of still did, was just how much really complex abstract mathematics goes mm into designing the algorithms that feed us adverts you know it's it's mm. a lot of it is almost cutting edge mathematical research to do this kind of thing so i mean could you describe some of the algorithms that are influencing our, our world today and and some of the sort of mathematics behind them and uh and how that's influencing life and death i suppose in in ways that people might not necessarily understand and, and whether we can change them to be a more unambiguous force for good wow yeah that's that's quite a, a deep problem, a huge question yeah <laughs> I think it depends to some extent what your perception of of good is. And actually, maybe I can give you an example to to explain how I don't think 
algorithms are necessarily this independent and impartial idea that we think they are sometimes or the, the popular perception is that we've divested uh, the work to an algorithm and therefore it's no longer biased so back in may 2016 facebook had a trending section on its website for, for news stories and actually there was an expose article in gizmodo which accused facebook of anti-conservative bias so they they heard testimony from a former facebook news curator who'd claimed that stories on right-wing political figures like mitt romney and Rand paul were being kept off facebook's trending topics by human intervention uh, and that even when conservative stories were naturally trending on facebook it was alleged that they um, weren't making it onto the trending list because people were keeping them off and in other cases it was suggested that left-wing stories had been artificially injected into the trending list even if they weren't popular enough to merit inclusion. So Facebook, based on this expose, decided to fire its trending editorial team to stop any human intervention. They completely divested the results uh, to an algorithm. So they let this algorithm um, decide which were the most popular stories. But unfortunately, within a few minutes of, of doing this, fake news started to trend uh, on the website, typically right wing fake news reporting things like Megyn Kelly, who was the Fox News anchor, being a closet liberal and being fired support for supporting Hillary Clinton. Um, all sorts of all sorts of fake news started to trend. And, and actually, that came to dominate Facebook's trending section over the next two years until eventually they decided to pull the plug on it. So. I, th I think the um, the idea that computers and algorithms are completely objective is is a popular one. It's it's probably though a misconception. Um, although computers implement algorithms in an objective manner, the algorithms themselves are of course written by humans, and these programmers who write the algorithms and the code. They, they have their own biases and those biases, whether consciously or unconsciously, might sometimes be transmitted into the algorithm themselves, um, obfuscating the prejudices that people actually have by translating them into computer code and making people think that actually these algorithms are more independent and reliable and trustworthy than they actually are. And, that, and that's the story that goes through the whole of the book is about um, trying to question this illusion of certainty that's brought about by numbers. Just because someone throws a number at you, it doesn't necessarily mean that that number is an independent nugget of hard truth. Like we said in the, uh, about the, the media chapter, um, people can manipulate numbers and statistics and paint them in a particular way to show you only one side of the coin. Really, you need to try to investigate as much as you can. Go to fact-checking websites like Snopes uh, and, and find out the true story behind the headlines and I think that's that's a really important message to take from the from the whole of the book. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, it's just sort of on that note. It's, this is going to be quite a, a broad, open-ended question. So apologies, I do like those. Um, in in the context of the crisis that we're in at the moment, we can see that how important scientific and mathematical literacy is, mm -hmm. and that it's really very crucial for having a well-functioning society and for people to you know get on get on board with this because it really is exposing any lack of scientific or mathematical literacy that people have whether it's on behalf of people or mm. the media or the decision makers along these lines so you know if if, if we were going to take some lessons from this and if you were in charge of um implementing some sort of new program for mathematical communication uh, for the general public or for or for you know in schools and so on what what kind of things would you want people to be uh, made aware of what kind of critical thinking would you like to see them apply to uh, the way that mathematical problems are presented and what what do you think it's important for for people to know um, to have that level of uh, I guess confidence with with mathematics to sort of question the things that they read and know when things are likely to be reliable and when they might not be yeah I think it's really important I think trying to improve um, mathematical literacy is, is an incredibly important thing and I think if anything that we we can take out of this this COVID-19 pandemic, it's that the people who've said, when, when am I ever going to use maths? When am I ever going to use this in the real world? Surely this is the greatest example of where mathematics is actually important and, and having an understanding of mathematics and a motivation for wanting to study mathematics is clearer than it ever has been. In terms of, of what people should be taught, I'm not I'm not a mathematical uh, education expert, but um, we need to we need to focus on the basics so that people can be properly armed when they go out to the shops to make sure they're not being shortchanged and and when they read the newspapers to make sure that they're not being hoodwinked by people who are slightly more mathematically literate than them. We have this great qualification in the UK. It's only a few years old called Core Maths, uh, which is sort of uh, help, helping to to bridge the gap 
between sort of GCSE level and A level, but it's all about applying maths in the real world. So calculating percentages so you know how much you're actually getting when you see a discount, for example. Um, so there's all sorts of amazing practical problems in there. And, and I would highly advise people who don't want to do A level maths, and that's completely fine. It's not for everyone to think about doing this core maths uh, qualification because it really is focused at, at real world maths and, and trying to make sure that people aren't taken for a ride by people who are unscrupulously using numbers for their own benefit okay that's i think that's really important and hopefully you know it's going to be one of the things where uh we're going to have a lot of science communicators being born out of this moment as well um mm. particularly when it comes to epidemiology but of course other things as well and people will get um more trusted sources of information and i've already seen some great things that people can do like interactive tools interactive seir models that people mm. have have put up online which i think is something fairly simple to do that can really aid people's understanding and you know these things aren't necessarily that hard to explain and, and part of i don't know maybe part of uh, i guess my disappointment i could say with with some of the things that have been happening in this in this country particularly is is the perception that you can't really trust people with the information or with the science or with the uncertainties and so on and i think what this has shown is that people do want to understand and they want to um have a greater in-depth understanding of the science that's 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 going on and influencing decisions and so on and and you can trust people with this information uh, if you're willing to take some time to explain it and make it accessible um and uh, yeah, I think that's really important. And mm. you, you obviously do a great deal of science communication work and people should follow you on Twitter. They can follow you kit underscore Yates underscore maths and they can see compilations of your sort of both your formal research and the science communication that you've done on kityates.com. Mm -hmm. um, but before you go, is there anything else that you've been working on now or that you've been uh, doing recently that you've been involved with that you think uh, people should check out if they're interested and want to find out more? Um, so there's a couple of things. Uh, we've talked a lot about about the book, The Maths for Life and Death. So there's lots of lots of fun maths in there. There's no equations in the whole book. So it's, it is hopefully really accessible for people to read. And it's all about stories. So there's just lots of stories of real people's lives. So it's not like a maths book. I wish I hadn't put the word maths in the title because I think it's put a lot of people <laughs> off but actually it is quite accessible I'm also writing another book which will be out in 2022 now in fact um, which is going to be called How to Expect the Unexpected which is uh, all about predicting the future so maybe I'll come back and talk about that uh, when that's out and then generally at the University of, of Bath I should probably put a plug in for the fact that we do have this, this website where we've uh, got some nice videos where we're explaining some of the basic basic mathematical uh, modeling of epidemiology and taking it a little bit further uh, but we also I should say have a widening participation scheme at Bath I'm, I'm the Department for Mathematical Sciences widening participation coordinator we have a program called Pathways to Bath which is um, a really great way for people to engage with with maths at Bath uh, if they're doing their A levels and thinking about doing maths at university uh, and to to get involved in this course you can you can do a, you we do some lectures you do some problem sheets and potentially you get a, a revised offer which makes it easier for you to get to bath if you have have, have done this so um i really i just want to encourage people as much as possible to think about doing maths uh, in higher education especially people who haven't traditionally been encouraged or haven't gone to schools where they've encouraged people to go to university and to do maths uh, at, at higher education level at university um, and to say that maths really only keeps doors open for you it doesn't close any doors if you do maths no one is going to look at your degree at the end and say oh well you can't go and write a book or you can't go and be a chemist you can't be a biologist because actually maths is the language of science and it really only ever keeps doors open for you so if you're wavering about what to do at university then you could do a lot worse than choosing maths so that's the end of my plug <laughs> Yeah. And for all you know, you know, you may end up uh, spending some of your time like arranging locusts in a circular right. tube, which it you might not fun. necessarily have traditionally thought of it. But as, as, as you say, there's so many options to go from uh, once mm -hmm. you have that basis for going into other areas of science. So, uh, well, I would also say that, of course, when your next book is out, we'd love to have you back on the show to talk about that. But um, until then, Kit, thanks very much for coming on the show. It's an absolute pleasure. Cheers, Thomas. Thanks for listening to this episode of Physical Attraction. Remember, you can find all of Kit's work and ways to find the book at kityates.com and you can find us at physicspodcast.com. The contact form is there where you can send us any questions, comments or concerns you might have about the show. We're on Twitter at physicspod. We're on Facebook, Physical Attraction. We have a Patreon account at patreon.com slash physicalattraction, which you can subscribe to if you'd like to help support the show. The best thing you can do to support us, though, is always to tell as many other people as possible to listen to the show and really increase that audience. 
And you can rate and review the show on any of your favourite podcasting platforms, which also helps us get noticed. Until next time then, take care.